Welcome to the Magnificast, the podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm your co-host, Dean Detloff. And I'm your other co-host, Matt Bernico. Matt, it's the end of Dads and Grad season once again here mid-June. And uh, as both a dad and a grad yourself, uh, how's it going? It's great. It's been a it's been a long dad day. Uh, we're recording this on Father's Day, by the way, in case you didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm giving myself a little Father's Day treat by recording a podcast. Um, and I'm also <laughs> giving you a little Father's Day treat, too, by recording a podcast. Thanks, Dad. Um, yeah, yeah, you're welcome. It's great. Uh, dads, we love them. Grads, we love them. Uh, but the season's over, and we can't talk about them anymore, so that's a big bummer. Um, instead of talking about dads or grads, we're going to talk about Religion, Revolution, and the Future by Jürgen Moltmann, uh, which is a book written in 1969. Dean, why are we talking about Jürgen Moltmann right now? <laughs> uh, for so many reasons. First of all, it's always a good time to talk about Jürgen Moltmann, so you don't really need a specific time, and I don't think we've ever done it on this podcast, so it's kind of an overdue. No, me either. Yeah, an overdue conversation. But uh, prompted by the fact that he did pass away on June 3rd this year, and he is a pretty significant figure in Christianity and the left, and a pretty unique European voice on uh, liberation theology in particular. Very interesting guy. We'll say more about that in a minute. But uh, maybe before we dive into it, this is a good first and last plug for a liberation theology class that I'm going to teach, which starts on Monday. Uh, at the Institute for Christian Studies online, and you can join it. And the reason I've been thinking about Moltmann in particular is because uh, in Latin American liberation theology, he's kind of one of these uh, Global North characters who shows up in more significant ways than others. And I'll give you maybe like the starkest example of that. Um, the Jesuits in San Salvador who were killed at the University of Central America, the UCA, which was a Jesuit school, um, they were assassinated uh, in the late 80s. Um, they, uh, when they were murdered, um, these Jesuits, they found a bloodstained copy of uh, Moltmann's book, The Crucified God, which is like a systematic theology um, book that he wrote. And uh, it had the blood of one of the Jesuits, uh, Father Moreno, on it. And that has become like a symbol of kind of global north-south solidarity and the importance of theology itself in the social struggle. So I guess uh, all that to say, we're talking about Moltmann because uh, it's about time, because he deserves to be talked about. And uh, his death is um, maybe a good, a good prompt to review some of the cool contributions that he's made. Yeah, for sure. Um, he definitely has like a particular type of liberation theology that he's developed himself. I guess I feel a little bit weird because we're not going to talk about like the crucified God, which is like, you know, the one of the big books that he wrote. Um, and we're not going to talk about his liberation theology necessarily. But we are going to talk a bit about uh, a, a chapter from a book called uh, Re Religion, Revolution, and the Future, where he talks about the Christian Marxist dialogue. And it's such an interesting thing because it's not theology. So if it was about theology, it would be boring. <laughs> I would be asleep. <laughs> it is about theology a bit. But it's interesting because uh, it's it's one of these books that is – I'm sorry. It's one of these – it's like a chapter in a book that is extremely of its time. Like it is a peak 1969 sort of theological thing that's happening where this um, German theologian is kind of paying attention to what some Marxists are saying about Christians and Christians are talking to Marxists and stuff. It's great, but it is it is very much of its time. Um, it, by which I mean in 2024, I don't know if there's a lot of Christians who are, who are keeping this Christian Marxist dialogue alive besides us or something. You know, there's just like, there's not these big <laughs> theological meetings between Christians and Marxists uh, because, uh, you know, the fall of the Soviet Union and all these other things as well. Um, and <laughs> probably in a similar way, there's also not a lot of like big meetings between Marxists and Christians who, where, where Marxists and communists are listening to what Christians have to say. It's just like, you know, both, both of these movements have really sort of waned in their importance in terms of what's going on in the world. But the chapter that we're going to read here in just a second is really interesting because it is kind of like another possible world that could have existed <laughs> had things played out differently. Um, but they but they don't. <laughs> Anyways, we can imagine it. Um, a really interesting sort of interchange about Christianity and Marxism and like what these ideas have to do with one another and, and, and what they give one another, um, kind of if you orient them in particular ways. So um, all that to say, yeah, we're we're not going to read one of the big Moltmann books, but we're going to read a very obscure but interesting <laughs> bit of uh, Jürgen Moltmann's thought 
That's right. And uh, maybe just to set the stage a little bit, too, before we do get into this very niche thing, because if you've never heard of Moltmann before, this is maybe like a pretty weird way <laughs> to learn about him. Um, but uh, it will be cool that you have this information. You can be very cool at a Moltmann themed party. You can have some incredibly niche info, but we want to make sure that you feel comfortable in such a party. So more generally, maybe it helps to think of Moltmann as a sort of like unique reformed theologian which i think is really interesting he was reformed in the way that like i don't know carl bart and some of these other people are reformed he read a lot of carl bart and i think extended a lot of bart's theology i'm not like a big carl bart guy but i went to a reformed graduate school so i learned more about reformed theology than i ever wanted to know <laughs> including jürgen moltmann uh all my professors were really into moltmann and he has like a really unique theology oriented, especially around themes of the future and hope and kind of eschatological time, apocalypse, all these like uh, ways of thinking about Christianity that really emphasize the like dynamic quality, you might say, of Christianity. And I think that makes him a really interesting and unique voice. He's pretty influenced also by uh, by Hegel and by other kinds of philosophers that some theologians get a little shy around, I think. And uh, for better and worse, I think sometimes that puts him in some weird spots, but other times opens up some themes in unique ways. Um, he did a lot of like systematic theology, but in ways that were not as boring, definitely, as other systematic theologies. And I think that you'll see that even in this particular uh, article or essay talking about Christianity and Marxism, by kind of attending to that dynamism in Christianity, it also opens him up to think about politics and social life and all these kinds of things in dialogue with other people. And he's, uh, I like to say that he's like one of those theologians who doesn't feel like a cop. Like he's not trying to like get all your categories straight or get you even on his side necessarily. He's more like a theologian who's trying to figure out, like, I found all these really cool things and I'd like to share them with you because they might help you kind of lead a, a more exciting and dynamic and uh, and just or liberatory sort of uh, Christian life. So um, anyway, that's that's whatever I, that's what I think about when I was thinking of Moltmann is this kind of like guy who's really into like the disruptive mm -hmm. categories in Christianity. Yeah, that sounds that sounds pretty good. That makes it way more interesting than <laughs> than systematic theology sounds on the surface, I think. <laughs> um, cool. Well, the essay starts off with Moltmann kind of reflecting on this uh, this meeting between Christians and Marxists uh, that he was at. And he kind of reflects on uh, some of the themes, right? Like, Christians are always trying to do something annoying. <laughs> they're, they're always trying to do a Christian thing. Marxists are always trying to do their critique of religion. <laughs> um, but uh, at this meeting that he is at, uh, it's quite interesting because instead of Christians doing the annoying Christian thing and Marxists doing the annoying Marxist thing, he says the opposite happens, actually. So he says that they, they being the, the Christians here, accentuated the engagement of the church with society, the hope for the earth, and the necessity of a Christian critique of unjust social conditions. And then the Marxists, on the other hand, uh, they uh, revise their well-known critique of religion and ask for a new openness of men for transcendence. It was expected that the theologians would be assigned the care of transcendence, while Marxists would assume responsibility for the formation of the world in a revolutionary way. Uh, he thinks that this is an interesting observation. That <laughs> isn't it? Isn't it funny that Christians are going to come to the table and and look for exactly the thing that they don't know how to do very well from the people that should know, and then and then vice versa with the Marxists. Um, this is you know an interesting observation, and he kind of will reflect on this throughout the um, throughout the entire chapter. But this is like a thing that uh, Moltmann is interested in, and it kind of draws him towards questions of uh, Christian freedom. And like, what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to like have hope for the future? What kind of freedom does Christianity allow? Um, and whether or not Christianity can like function as a type of critique or like, a critical speaking point, I don't know, I guess prophetic, you could just say. Um, and, and, you know, how does that, how does that work in terms of like social transformation? These are the, the big questions of this, uh, this chapter that we're reading. Yeah, as we'll see, freedom is kind of the unifying principle that Moltmann uses for talking about Christians and Marxists uh, together. And he has a lot of interesting things to say about freedom and how to get it and what it is and isn't and distinguishing it too from certain visions of freedom you get in liberalism, for example. And we'll get to all of that. But I think actually the easiest way to kind of get the vibe that he's going for is to base it on this one 
passage that I really liked. Um, and also, uh, I should say, so Moltmann's writing this in 1969, and uh, he or his translators are both tend to default to like masculine language for a uh, universal language, saying like men as a stand in for all people. And I'm just, I don't know, I never really know the best way to handle those things. I'm just going to change them as I read it to be more yeah, good gender idea. inclusive, I guess. Um, but if you're reading the essay, you'll find that not to be the case. Uh, so this is what he says. Just make it be more gender inclusive by just using the word guy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to use people and see how it goes, uh, but I might end up defaulting to guys as a, as a guy myself. Okay, fair. <laughs> that sounds good, too. He says, uh, some people base their community on answers alone. Such communities are always biased, factious, and confessional. They cannot be universal. However, there is also a community of people based on asking. This is the community of the seeking and hungry, neither biased nor confessional. It is a community pervading all parties and churches, uniting people in their common experience of deficiency and not knowing. Such a community of questioning and seeking can today unite Christians and Marxists. Formerly, the Marxists appeared to us as dogmatists who had all the right answers to all questions. Today, Christian theologians appear to be possessors of an unquestionable and incontrovertible truth. Often they have answers to all human questions and are astonished that people are unwilling to pose questions to them anymore. Bertolt Brecht wrote in one of his calendar tales, I've noticed, said Mr. Coiner, that we scare away many people from our doctrine uh, because we know an answer to everything. Couldn't we, in the interest of our propaganda, comprise a list of questions which seem to us to be completely unsolved? Yeah, agreed, uh, Brecht line. <laughs> Should definitely make such a list. <laughs> sure. Mine would be very long. But I love uh, this way of putting things that, Christians and Marxists both kind of have a reputation for having all the answers, and I am guilty of it myself. Uh, love to have some confident opinions about all kinds of things, but uh, Moltmann is trying to put the emphasis on the asking and seeking things out together. Um, I think sometimes this can be a really annoying trait in certain uh, forms of progressive Christianity, where it's like, okay, it's all about the questions, it's never about the answers, and that means you never yeah. also get around to committing to anything, so it's like always trying to, you know, like, un destabilize the categories such that you never really, like, land on something that can give you political action. And I think there is maybe some, like, rhetorical danger there, but Moltmann uh, clearly <laughs> doesn't land yeah. in that uh, camp. Um, on the contrary, he thinks that if you build a, a community of asking, you're going to end up um, kind of on a path toward justice in particular, you know, toward asking good questions about why people are hungry and so on. And uh, I really like that way of phrasing things, that it's not a community of, of answers alone, but a, a community of asking. And that's kind of the the emphasis on non-knowing and, and openness is also the key to uh, working together. Um, it's a, a great way to kind of start thinking about that theology of freedom, that he wants people to be free to ask questions and kind of follow where they lead. Yeah, I think that makes sense. You know, this is a digression, but I'll do it because this is a podcast and what else are they for? But uh, when I saw the metaphor of the community of seeking and hungry, I immediately went to this like weird Christian way of talking that I heard a lot when I was an evangelical. And people talk about going to church to get fed. I don't know if this is a familiar phrase right. to you, Dean. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, hate, I hate that, first of all. I think that's <laughs> – it makes me feel gross and queasy. Um, <laughs> just a <laughs> weird church drama, I guess. Uh, but it did kind of make me think about exactly what you were saying, right? Like the um, – uh, on the one hand, there will be churches that you go to, and they give you the answers. They give you the stuff that you want. They they give they they make sure that you're fed, and what they're feeding you is like <laughs> absolute garbage. Um, <laughs> but then, but like you said too, there's another way of of which uh, if it's all about questions, or um, if it's about like the the holy act of seeking imperfect questions or whatever, <laughs> it can be destabilizing. It can be like a non-committal way. But to me, it seems like, you know, there's an easy way to sort of split this. And it's like asking good questions <laughs> and then actually trying to find answers to those questions rather than just like living in the liminal space of, of you know, <laughs> of, of whatever we're doing here. There's a there's a, a way to cut between the uh, the bad type mm -hmm. of church uh, feeding and the good type. <laughs> I'm sorry, the bad type of church feeding and the 
bad type of church only asking questions. So um, <laughs> I appreciate uh, Moltmann on this point. Yeah, and I guess that's the key is uh, trying to figure out exactly how you express Christianity in a way that, that cuts between those things and the category freedom, as we said, is Moltmann's way of doing it. Um, he has a great section on what he calls the religion of freedom and uh, starts to parse this out a little bit. So I'll read kind of a long passage and we can pause and talk it through. He says, the Christian faith understands itself authentically as the beginning of a freedom that was hitherto unseen to the world. Some real theology talk here. Christian faith not only believes in freedom, but is already freedom itself. It not only hopes for freedom, but rather is in itself the inauguration of a free life on earth. However, it is just a historical beginning and not yet the universal fulfillment. There is an inexorable difference between the realm of freedom, which we hope will ultimately free the whole creation from its misery, and the beginning of freedom here in the midst of a world full of bondage and slavery. Christian faith is freedom in struggle, in contradiction, and in temptation. The realm of freedom, however, of which the present beginning is faith, is freedom in its own new world, that is, God's free world. The difference between freedom and faith and the realm of freedom is the motor and the motive power for our work of realizing freedom in history. Uh, I think, uh, again, you could maybe like read Moltmann and find some rhetorical dangers here. For example, like simply asserting that Christian faith is already freedom itself is like kind of hard to say <laughs> because for a lot of people, it is exactly the opposite that Christian faith is uh, enslavement, literally in some cases, or, uh, you know, a an oppressive force in a person's life and so on. Um, and Moltmann does like address that in other places. I think, you know, he's being kind of rhetorically fast and loose here in a way that I would not be, but um, I'm kind of just maybe uh, giving him a bit of an out by saying uh, he affirms that Christianity doesn't really like live up to this itself or it finds all kinds of ways of like stymieing that freedom. But the key is his affirmation of the the contradiction that Christianity is kind of this um, this inauguration of freedom. It points toward a future of freedom, but it recognizes that we don't live in that future exactly right now. And so the Christian task is to kind of live into the freedom that you have with the understanding that you're trying to increase freedom to bring freedom to the world and to yourself and so on. So there's room for those kind of contradictions, but uh, definitely some real uh, <laughs> extremely Christian kind of language here uh, that elides some of the difficulties. But I think it, it helps at least to to see that freedom is the controlling category for Moltmann, um, which maybe we could talk about in a minute, but it's also a... Uh, a deep like apocalyptic and millenarian strand within Christianity. Yeah, I think that the way that Moltmann is talking about freedom here is, well, I mean, it, it kind of, this is sort of the point, I think, in, in some parts of the text. But the way that he's talking about freedom in this big millenarian kind of way, in this big apocalyptic way, is also really similar to the way that socialists talk about communism, though. I, and I think that mm -hmm, that is right. a pretty stark, um, well, it's a pretty obvious thing to point out and like, I don't know if he, I guess he's doing it purposely probably um, but you know he just mentioned the whole thing about communists looking for transcendence and like this is kind of it <laughs> like this is the this is the bit from the German ideology where you know Marx says that communism isn't like a thing it's it's the real movement that abolishes the present state of things and I mean that's exactly what he's saying here about Christianity that it's you know Christianity is not itself um it's not itself like the current moment. It's not what we have exactly now, but it's the inauguration of the whole movement of the thing that is toward mm -hmm. freedom. So it's, it's like these similar ideas in the way that they're stacked here. Um, but yeah, um, cool. Sorry, another another digression. That's all I've got right now is just digression after digression. <laughs> uh, I'll read the next piece here from from Moltmann and we'll we'll talk through what comes next. This freedom and faith must be made clear to the atheist as well to the religious person of today. For the former is still thinking either there is a God in which the case people cannot be made free or people are free, in which case there cannot or may not be a God. This is like the argument that Marx, Engels, Bakunin, all of the existentialists and all kinds of other people make. <laughs> you, know, you know, you know it, you love it. You've heard it before. <laughs> um, then he goes on to say, those are actually the alternatives in the mythological world of religions. For in that world, the half-god Prometheus becomes the hero of man's freedom over and against the gods. He is still the philosophical saint of Marxism. Here, God and people are considered to be one and the same essence. Thus, what you grant God, you must have to take away from people, and what you grant people, you have to take away from God. 
But when will we stop measuring God and people with the same yardstick? This is, again, as far as I understand it, not being a Reformed person or a theologian, really. <laughs> but it's the kind of thing you get in Karl Barth as well, where freedom, uh, God's freedom and human freedom are not like mutually exclusive kind of zero sum uh, relationships. Or to put it differently, like, you know, Marx in particular is drawing off of uh, Feuerbach in his atheism Um and this will be a great digression, I guess, uh, since we're doing them. Uh, Feuerbach is a intriguing German uh, materialist guy who wrote a pretty influential um, essay about religion, where he argues that uh, basically religion is a, a projection of human capacities or desires onto uh, an elusive thing called God or religion or whatever. So humans kind of you know, we think about our capacities or incapacities, and then we kind of make up a being that has those capacities to an ultimate degree or can help us with our deficiencies in our own capacities. So, for example, we can know a little bit of stuff. God gets to know everything. We have a little bit of power. God has all the power and so on and so forth. And Feuerbach makes this argument that the more people give over to the supernatural entity, to God or whatever, the less of those capacities they have in themselves. So this is kind of the fundamental criticism of religion that, you know, the more you kind of give God the power and control and knowledge and so on, the less power, control and knowledge you yourself have. And there's like an obvious point there, right? Like you can think of lots of Christians who do exactly that. They kind of outsource their own capacities or confidence to God. So you can't really do anything good in the world or you can't really do anything of any importance in the world it's all kind of god doing stuff and it really evacuates your sense of agency or freedom and so on um so there's something to it right but it, it relies on this zero sum kind of logic that whatever you give over to god you can't retain in the human and, and vice versa uh and what i like about what Maltman is doing kind of drawing from that bardian tradition is to say well maybe there's other ways of thinking about these things that like divine and human freedom don't have to be quantitative relationships um they might even be kind of mutually um enforcing relationships or uh you know important just relationships in general things that relate to one another and i think that is actually a pretty cool theological premise uh, that moltmann is interested in that we don't have to choose between you know prometheus stealing the fires of the gods and bringing them down to people but instead we could uh try to think about a more like a uh, dialogical relationship between God and humanity. Okay. So um, we're doing digressions. We're still doing them. Here's mine for this, for this one. Here's my digression for this part <laughs> of the podcast. So I've been watching the new season of survivor and I was just telling you this in, in our, in our ongoing chat Dean, but I'm going to put it on the podcast because it's very funny. So there's this guy that was on the season who is very sweet, a very sweet man. His name is Banu and I really like him and he got voted off pretty quick. So no spoiler alert there really. <laughs> he's he's not on for very long. Uh, anyways, throughout the entire show, he is like constantly praying to God that he that uh, for God to help him like fix his bad Survivor game. <laughs> Which is what else would you do? I know what else would you do? Um, and uh, and and there's like there are a few moments where things turn around for him, and it's like oh this is Bonnie's not going to get voted out quite yet, and then he's like oh see look God's coming in here to save me, and then. Um, and then he gets voted off the island and he on like on TV, he does curse God in <laughs> a lot of TV, <laughs> which I think is like, it's, it's just good television. Honestly, it's the best, the best that TV has to offer. <laughs> he is just like, he's pointing at the sky and yelling at God for like voting him off. And Banu, I'm so sorry, my friend. <laughs> I hope you live a great life because you seem like a very nice person. Um, but uh, have you ever thought that maybe you're participating <laughs> in this whole situation as well? <laughs> <laughs> uh that's awesome poor bonnie he really needs to read his uh reformed systematic theology i guess yeah to sort i'm out. not sure that he's really a christian either so it's fine either way <laughs> uh, but he was just really <laughs> i don't know if you're getting to the point where you're cursing god for all of god's mistakes maybe you have to reconsider this whole theological framework you have going on here <laughs> Love it. Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, all right, we can continue the digressions, and then we'll get back to Mulan in a minute. Yeah. But um, this is not not as funny as Survivor. But uh, I know this is also a topic that Matt and I like to talk about off the air um, too much. And uh, the kind of theme of freedom that you get in Mulan's theology 
is interesting because it picks up on these really weird, uh, I, I referred to them earlier as millenarian trends in apocalyptic Christianity. And Molman does that on purpose. Like he's very interested in those trends and tries to kind of build a, a theology that is, I don't know, expressing them differently in the 20th century. And uh, it would be, we might as well talk about them because they're very fun. Uh, basically in the medieval period, like I guess around the thousands, 1100s, 1200s, etc. Um, that kind of like early medieval period, there was this really unique way of interpreting um, Christian history and salvation history in an apocalyptic way. And the reason it's called a millenarian tradition is that it has to do with these kind of millennia or like epochs or ages. And there's definitely some like weird theological stuff going on here for sure. Uh, and probably some anti-Semitism as well, mm -hmm. but I'll just explain how it works and then we can talk about it from there. So the interpretation basically says that we often think about the Bible as, or salvation history as kind of bound up in two books, right? The Old Testament and the New Testament. But what if there was a secret third book, uh, the book that we're in right now? Um, and it interprets history in this way. The Old Testament is the age of the father and the age of law. So you get you know, Yahweh, he's laying down the law, he's creating these laws, he's doing all this judging of nations in the uh, the biblical story, and so on. And then you have the second age, uh, or the second book, which is the age of the sun, or love. So Jesus comes to reveal that we are liberated from uh, the kind of age of the law to live in this different way, based on love. And then finally, though, there's the third age or third book, which is the book of the spirit. And that is the age of freedom. And in these millenarian traditions, they try to make the argument that like um, the, pol the political order of medieval society and even the church in some cases is bound to one or both of these past ages. Either they're like stuck in the psychology of the law or they're stuck kind of fetishizing the age of love but they don't make the third move to be like we're living in the the kind of freedom that's made possible by um, by that salvation history. And it's really interesting. There were all these like dissident movements in Christianity that spawned. And uh, maybe I'll have Matt talk about them in a minute because I think you've read a lot more about them than I have. But uh, what Moltmann is doing is like intentionally reaching back into that impulse in medieval Christianity and then trying to like express it again in like a different way in the 20th century and i think that's very cool like more theologians should just find weird stuff happening in the medieval moment and then like take them more theologically seriously so i don't know matt uh what's a <laughs> what's a cool weird dissident medieval millenarian movement there's just to just to give some flavor here yeah there are so many of them um i think the the one that is like most obvious especially around the uh the idea of like um freedom is the brethren of the free spirit so the Brethren of the Free Spirit, where it's it's complicated. So there's this book that's by this um, French anarchist, uh, a guy named Raoul Vanayam. He's like he was like the main philosopher of the Situationist movement. Um, so uh, Guy Debord, he's great, but Raoul Vanayam is like the real brains behind the operation. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe not exclusively. That's that's unfair, but <laughs> but uh, a little true. <laughs> Anyways, so the Brethren of the Free Spirit it is like this weird movement that kind of comes out of like, yeah, the, the 1200s, the 1100s. Um, that, sorry, that's like a 200 year gap. I, I would I think it's like more in the 1200s, if I'm recalling. Sorry, Dean put me on the spot and this is all coming off the top of my head. So maybe I won't get it exactly <laughs> right in terms of that part. But they have all these like really interesting beliefs that kind of are coming out of what Dean just mentioned that like, you know, the the uh, living in the age of the spirit, right? You're um, the work of the work of like reconciliation between God and people are, is like is over. And now there's like this type of freedom that um, these people believe that they had. And like, there are these weird groups that are like roaming around, you know, the area that would be Germany and like that whole Alpine region. <laughs> and there's all kinds of different, um, different beliefs that are kind of going along with it. But a big idea is that, um, that, you know, it, <laughs> There's there's some some big heretical vibes here too, but you know it's like your your body it's it's not great, 
<laughs> your body is not great, but your soul, <laughs> extremely perfect. Um, and you can't, and, and uh, were you able to see your soul, you wouldn't be able to tell it. You wouldn't be able to tell that it's different than God, that your God, God and your soul are the same thing. Um, or sometimes people like, uh, Magritte Perret, uh, say that, you know, your soul is a reflection of God. Like your soul is a big mirror that just reflects God's goodness or something. And what you have to do is find ways to, um, deny yourself, deny your body to, to hew your, hew your body away and like peel the bad stuff out and only let the, the shiny good God mirror kind of show, show through. And like, <laughs> there's some interesting theological ideas there. Uh, but also like it did lead like the, 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 uh, the stress between like, um, freedom in, um, freedom in this like weird after Jesus time. And also the idea that like you have God in you in this, in this like real way led to like the brethren of the free spirit basically just being criminals. <laughs> like they would just be like <laughs> bandits and they would steal from like rich people and they would, you know, murder people. And um, anyway, it's very interesting. Lots of influences from like Gnosticism and all that kind of stuff. So that's one example I think that is quite interesting. But another one is like the Waldensians who are like a little less out there <laughs> but a lot of a lot of same ideas kind of coming out there right the the waldensians they're like another sort of like aesthetic movement that is um popular right before like saint francis again like in the 1200s and like switzerland kind of in that area but they were like the the whole point of the waldensians was not necessarily like the freedom uh to like rob and beat people and murder people um but instead was uh to take up poverty as a way to perfection and it's like that is the way that that's the way towards freedom, right? Again, to sort of like strip away all of the all of the bad stuff and to become like a, a poor person is is like that's freedom. That's the uh, the direction to get there. And there's something really interesting about that. I mean, you know, there's a real radical notion that kind of underlies it for sure. Uh, they're also um, anti papist That was a big part of it, too. Sorry, I'm throwing so much at you at once here. Um, <laughs> but it's like the idea that you have to put down all of these other things to, be, to really be free. And like that's a, that's a particular idea that is a, a Christian idea of freedom. That's like a, a Christian interpretation of how how you become a free person is you do what Jesus does, does right? And like you, you strip away all these things like the family and possessions and ownership, all of it. And then through that, you can t you, you find a type of like – existence in the world that is radically different than the way that everyone else lives um there's there's and the, and i i mean i think it makes sense right there's like that is there's a type of freedom in that of having nothing and being sort of just a person that floats around in your community yeah i don't know <laughs> that seems free uh it seems like too free to me i would want to be a little bit less free than that <laughs> <laughs> yeah but all, all kinds of wild ideas um in christianity around freedom Moltmann has some that are i think a little bit more tenable <laughs> in my perspective <laughs> yeah that's right and i guess like the key too is uh to see the freedom stuff as uh having a, a kind of political program built into it in some interesting ways like that transgressive stuff that reaches a a fever pitch maybe in the brethren of the free spirit um is also expressed in like St. Francis of Assisi, who was also drawing on these same kind of themes. Uh, there's a guy named Joachim of Fiore, who's like the the rule rubble of an eye of the Middle Ages, you could say, <laughs> the, the supreme intellectual architect of uh, apocalypticism. But uh, there's this kind of sense that when you lean into the freedom part, you're able to like own the gift that Jesus gives through, you know, accomplishing the work that he does yeah. on the cross and like giving us this message of love. And uh, what I really like about it is it's a kind of playful question of like, that's great that Jesus came here and died on the cross and resurrected. And like, what now, you mm -hmm. know, <laughs> it's like the, what now question is the kind of question that this tradition is trying to ask. Like, what does that mean for how we live our lives and kind of lean into the, the new world that was inaugurated by Jesus. So Moltmann is, is pulling all that out. Maybe, as well. maybe the St. Francis connection is actually a helpful pivot to talk about Moltmann a bit more here because what you get with so, like when we say freedom in terms of, you know, as a political idea to us in 2024, what we're talking about are individual freedoms, right? Like that's where our brains go. Mm -hmm. That's the, you know, you have the freedom to say whatever you want within certain boundaries. You have the freedom to bear arms. If you live in the United States, all this kind of stuff. 
But I think what's really interesting about somebody like St. Francis and then, you know, some of the other some of these other wild Christians, too, for sure, they they get at this as well. But for St. Francis, like the the freedom that he finds in poverty um, and it, it is not a type of freedom that's just like <laughs> the ability to run to a movie theater and yell fire or something. Right. It's not an individual <laughs> freedom. It's a type of freedom where you are free with the rest of creation to do right your to do your thing you know to be a to be a mm-hmm. cricket on the wall of your cell or whatever um which is a qu- quite a different type of freedom than you know you have the freedom to go vote in an election or you have the freedom to mm-hmm. uh, acquire private property some something pretty vastly different than that right uh maybe that's a good segue finally to return to what Maltman says we about did what freedom is for him. Uh we did it. All the digressions have led to one place. Um he also distinguishes what he's trying to say from what he calls explicitly a liberal version of freedom, kind of based on that uh often a negative expression of freedom that you're free from all these kinds of constraints or free in an individual way. And instead, Moltmann says, freedom is no private affair, but is always freedom for others. Therefore, the Christian faith cannot acquiesce in the liberties of individual people. To believe is no private hobby, but hope for the whole, for society, for humankind, for the earth. On the other hand, socialism cannot be the heir of Christian freedom, for neither a social nor a political system of life is able to realize already, here and now, that future of freedom for which the Christian faith is hoping. The Christian faith will find its peace only when it rests in the realm of God's freedom. Until then, however, it remains a troublemaker in every society, which is content with itself and coerces its people to regard themselves as happy and fortunate. I love that in particular. Mm -hmm. Uh, Resisting uh, (laughs) resisting the need to feel happy and fortunate because of your great political order is something that I think uh, everybody should feel free to do, (laughs) for sure. Um, He goes on to say some more stuff that we could talk about later, I guess. Uh, But I think the interesting thing here to me is that he's trying to say that, again, there's this kind of public aspect to freedom or a communal and transmissible aspect to freedom. And also he's trying to say that when he says socialism isn't the kind of ultimate heir of Christian freedom, I think he's resisting, especially Marxist claims, that Christians basically have nothing to give that can't be kind of like translated out of christianity into a more secular vein or uh you know we don't lose anything by pulling out what's good moltman is trying to say well there's a horizon that extends beyond uh all all realized political orders and insofar as christians exist in any political order they'll always kind of be in a certain sense you know causing a bit of trouble and i think on the one hand you can see this as you could see it in a, a bad way as just like arbitrarily um, arbitrarily praising the position of being a contrarian or even like always praising the position of the dissident. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I do think we have to make room for dissidents and so on. But I think there's something more going on here. Like, for example, the example that came to mind for me when I was thinking of this is uh, the student Christian movement in Cuba where the family code vote was, you know, like having a hard time getting off the ground because uh, not only were there conservative Christians opposing it within Cuba, but even like old guard Marxists were like not ready for, you know, a more progressive law around gender, sexuality and family formations. And the student Christian movement played a huge, huge role in trying to educate the Cuban public and create space for conversation around why a just society requires something like the family code. And, I, you know, they were sort of troublemakers in a sense. On the one hand, they were working with the Cuban government because the Cuban government wanted the family code to be passed. Um, but they were troublemakers with the with respect to the kinds of, like, ideologies that were preventing that um, that movement from happening. So I don't think that it has to end up being, like, in a... I don't know, the, the contrarian or the dissident is always in an unqualified way, the mm-hmm. morally superior position. But to kind of point out, like, what is the kind of trouble that Christians want to make? It's the uh, the kind of trouble that looks for what is insufficient in this revolution such yeah. that justice can be done. And how can Christians, like, you know, bring some more sufficiency to it? I think that makes a lot of sense. Something I had, like, a, a hard uh, kind of like a block on when I was reading this is just, like, I think as a person formed in the United States, freedom is a word that has like a lot of weird connotations that you kind of have to fight through. And that was what I was finding I was doing in this. Like whenever I think of the word freedom, I don't really think of 
what you've just mentioned. Like that whole story does not sound like the freedom I know. <laughs> you know, freedom is like <laughs> right. freedom is the ability to do kind of like whatever you want in the world and sort of just you know you have you, you can uh, mobilize your assets to do you know whatever goal you feel like achieving. But the type of freedom that I think we're talking about here is quite different. Not like a freedom to just sort of like do your own thing or a freedom to make money. But it, if it makes me think of like <laughs> like like a pressure washer or something, right? Like you have the freedom to spray the side <laughs> of this dirty ass building and like wash all of the, the gross stuff <laughs> off of it. It's like I don't want to say it's like freedom towards truth because that seems like too lofty. But it is like to pick away at the stuff that does seem false. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, And I mean, there's lots of other, um, uh, how to put it, like other aspects, I guess, of freedom that I think living in the U.S. in particular make it really hard to understand. Um, This is a really fun, I haven't read this book in a very long time, but it was written by a friend of mine named Jeff Hawking. Um, It's called Freedom Unlimited. It was, I'm pretty sure it was his master's thesis, maybe when he was at the Institute for Christian Studies where I went to school. And he was really interested in exactly this theme, like how do uh, not only reformed theologians, but also liberation theologians think about the category of freedom. And he does a really good job. It's very short, easy to read. You can read it in a day. But uh, he, (laughs) I remember reading it. He had this really kind of funny observation about how like we in the U.S. especially are trained to think of freedom as the negation of limitations or kind of pushing beyond a limitation. So you're not free if you bump up against the limit. But he said it, it couldn't be further from the truth in our actual like experience of the world. Because, for example, when you're like a little kid and your parent tells you don't touch this extremely hot stove, um, that prohibition exists so that you can lead a life that is more free than it would be otherwise. Because you're not like more free if you're able to burn your hand. You're actually more free to lead a good life if you don't burn your hand. So the kind of like, you know, uh, limitation that's imposed by a parental figure, you know, not arbitrarily or just because they're an authority or whatever, but because they like seek the good of another person, those kinds of limitations actually enable and increase our freedom rather than holding them back. All that to say, lots of really fun things to talk about with freedom as a theme, but uh, I, I like the way Moltmann is kind of bringing out this public aspect of freedom, that freedom is freedom for other people, not, you know, this private thing that you kind of used to compete with other people's private freedoms. I've got to tell my son this, that the reason I'm telling him what to do is because I want him to leave, <laughs> to lead a more free life in the future. Um, It'll work, I'm sure. Yeah, Dean, whenever you come here, you'll have to also tell him that, because maybe he'll listen to you and not me. Um, <laughs> okay, so we got so much freedom out here on the, on the table, um, and we're talking about what it means. Uh, but then uh, Moltmann goes on to talk about, like, freedom is a less abstract idea um more about the movements that are are seeking freedom that are, that are kind of interesting so l- let me read this bit here it's also a bit long but i think there's something interesting going on uh in this that is a bit different than what you might hear from other i don't know christians on the left or progressive christians or whoever else is talking to you who can say anyways uh Moltmann says the freedom movements based on christian faith on the church, on the conscience, on the citizen, and socialism, have succeeded one another in such a way that the one caught fire in the disappointing consequences of the preceding one as each strove for greater freedom. So far, not one of them has brought about the realm of freedom itself, but each one has opened a new front in the struggle for freedom. None of these revolutions was at yet the last battle, although everyone set out, although everyone set out under this apocalyptic sign, be it the struggle against the Antichrist, against the beast coming from the bottomless pit, or of the class enemy. <laughs> Therefore, these movements have always corrected each other. The older brother on the road to freedom must warn his younger brother, lest the younger give up liberties already won for the sake of new liberty. A revolution has to assimilate the tradition of the former revolutions, otherwise it achieves not more freedom, but simply another liberty. On the other hand, tradition must adapt itself to revolution, otherwise it will not prevail over its own disappointments, such as integration of Catholics, Protestants, liberals, and Marxists, is possible once all of them learn to look beyond their own systems forward to the future realm of freedom. So this is a really interesting thing to say, especially in light of like this, like the, um, the Marxist Christian dialogue movement that's happening at the beginning of this chapter. So when he's talking about, you know, freedom movements and, um, and revolution and the assimilations of traditions, he's not talking about like 
one or the other, like sort of being primary, but all of them sort of together um, picking up on this like energy or this vibe that they all have, um, which is really interesting. Um, I, I like this a lot because it does recognize all of these movements, whether they are socialist or whether or not they're just Christian as being kind of a part of the movement toward freedom. Again, like the real movement <laughs> that abolishes the present state of things. Uh, such an interesting thing to see like pop up in a, in a theological, you know, from a theologian like this, right. That, that uh, these, these movements are um, all bending in one direction or, uh, you know, there's like the, the Martin Luther King Jr. Quote that the, you know, the, the, his, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice or something, which I think is actually a complicated thing to say. And maybe I don't actually believe that. Um, but, uh, the arc of history is long and it's our job to bend history towards justice is maybe a better, <laughs> a better way of thinking it. But uh, anyways, all that to say, I like this idea that, um, that everyone working towards freedom, regardless of what faith you're a part of, or whether or not you're a socialist explicitly or something, that there's some kind of like resonance between them all. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, there is a really interesting longer section that we won't talk through, but he he talks about kind of each each of these different like moments in revolutionary history or freedom movement history, however you want to put it, and kind of what did they open up in terms of freedom and what did they ultimately end up doing that is a disappointment. So, for example, he talks about um, the church and kind of it's, you know, it's trying to respond to the the inauguration of freedom that you get in the life of Jesus but it inevitably creates this you know bureaucratized order of uh yeah paranoia and all kinds of stuff that you get in the worst moments of catholic history so then you have stuff like the reformation and it also is trying to open this new sort of vision of freedom but inevitably sides with the princes and lots of other problems right so you end up with uh the the revolution of the citizens or the the kind of liberal uh revolution um that you get in the french revolution let's say or the u.s revolution um but these two contain all kinds of injustices on on and on and on until you get to socialism um which he clearly sees as kind of the most advanced form of freedom struggle right now but also one that isn't without its own problems he talks a lot about stalinism being very bad for example and things like that and what I think is fascinating about his presentation of this is, on the one hand, it is a kind of like Hegelian way of telling a story, right? That um, something starts, uh, it opens up this new possibility in history, it inevitably kind of also starts to close down on that initial promise that creates a tension out of which that opening has to be opened up again by a new kind of movement that's different than the first one. But what I think is kind of unique in Moltmann is that he... Uh, he doesn't think that like once a freedom movement has become a disappointment or led to a disappointment, then you just kind of like throw it out. Um, on the contrary, it seems like he has this vision where all these freedom movements having persisted and preserved something of themselves, they could actually continue to work together. Um, like they don't sort of abolish and replace an earlier freedom struggle. And uh, it's actually really important to keep all the lines of communication between these freedom struggles open. And I actually was just reflecting on how I feel like that's a really unique position, even in terms of like political readings of history or philosophy and so on. And uh, yeah, a, a clever way to both provide like a history of freedom struggles that kind of ends in also a political program for freedom struggles. Yeah, I think that's true. You know, there is a, a really short essay by Deleuze and Guattari, these um, these two French guys, <laughs> these two French guys that Italians <laughs> love to read. Um, is <laughs> a great way to, uh, to boil them down. Uh, they have an, a really short essay, though. It's called like something like the 1968 revolution did not take place, referencing the mm -hmm. May-June uprisings in France. Uh, but what what the the point that they make in in their essay and other people kind of take this and and run with it elsewhere is that like a revolution or an uprising or revolt you know it doesn't ever really begin or end it just kind of like it simmers and it boils and it you know maybe stagnates but then it will sometimes simmer and boil again later um all that to say that like you know that's that's politics for you that I think is quite interesting that uh like you said there there are things that are um that prove to be disappointments and they simmer out for a while and, you know, later they come back and <laughs> like the, the return of particular types of protest or the, 
uh, or organizations of people or like even, you know, just just topics that people are like suddenly care about again for some reason. But anyways, yeah, I think it's a, a great point that like these these movements that we have that are um, focused on freedom in, in one way or another, they don't go away. They fall into the background. You know, we don't think about them for a while. Maybe they become repressed and unpopular. But uh, I think what you see historically is that they often come back to haunt you in a in a fun way. Mm hmm. That's right. Uh, well, if that maybe is a, a kind of way of bringing the past into the present, maybe as we close, we can move to the other side of the equation here, the future coming into the present. Um, Moltmann is very famous for talking about the category of the new, or as he likes to call it, the novum, um, which is like the Latin term for new. And he deploys it in a really interesting way here um, with some great choice quotes. So uh, I'll read through this part and then we can figure out what it has to do with Christians and Marxists uh, toward the end. He says, I think we can overcome this kind of division and combination if we begin to take notice of the eschatological category of novum. And he's talking about the division between Marxists and Christians kind of like accusing each other of uh, having it all sewn up. He says, why do Christians seek their salvation in heaven and why do they feel redeemed by heavenly promises if the first heaven will pass away and be replaced by a new heaven? Even, quote, in heaven, Christians will not be safe from the future of the God who judges and creates everything anew. I love that phrase. <laughs> very, very fun. Uh, on the other hand, one can ask why the Marxists seek their salvation on the earth and feel secure in earthly promises if it may be likewise true that this earth does not endure but will pass away. Neither heaven nor earth, neither history nor transcendence are, in the last analysis, secure places. There is salvation only in the new creation of heaven and earth, history and transcendence. The powers of the future world are historically effective in the criticism of heaven, just as in the criticism of earth, i.e. in the liberation from religious and ideological superstition, as well as in the liberation from the anonymous and repressive powers of society and the obstinacy of human work. Um, really love the idea of the future being this, like, constantly sort of in a way like threatening but also in a, a positive threatening way um to everything that we do in the present that whether you know we're seeking salvation in some future world that doesn't really exist like a, a heaven of you know peace and platitude or whatever Moltmann is like well in heaven you're still gonna have to do stuff with your perfect spherical bodies um so uh you know there, there's a future in eternity and uh for the marxist as well um, every single kind of order that we build is going to be threatened by the potentiality of injustice or the insufficiency of the revolution. And the future also impinges on that reality. Uh, and I really like that kind of deployment of the future and the category of the new as something that always kind of like upsets all the the stagnating ideologies that we might have or the stagnating visions of a world that we might make. Um, I think that's a good contribution of Christian theology in general to kind of insist on those categories. Yeah, it's true um, that Christians believe in like the most horrifying thing possible that like justice is possible and that you might get what you deserve is right. a very terrifying idea. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yikes. Um, okay. Yeah. Maybe, maybe more on this point though about Christianity and Marxism. Um, this is uh, uh, Moltmann talking more about like the cooperation between, between Christians and Marxists. Uh, so I'll read a bit more here that I think is exciting. Moltmann says, I think it is impossible to reduce Christianity and Marxism with their divergent positive conceptions to a lowest common denominator. Okay, very good. But a Christian Marxist cooperation in the present necessary negation of the negative is indeed quite conceivable. In the first place, there can be created a common future only out of the common averting of common threats by evil such as atomic war, catastrophes of famine, and so forth. This method has the advantage of solidarizing a very complicated word from my mouth to say for some reason, <laughs> solidarizing very different men and groups, and two, of leaving open to them the freedom of shaping their own future. We may not know what true humanity is and how a just order of the world looks, but what humankind should not be and which order of things is false, we can know by consideration of the past and also by consideration of the future's possible development. Only in the concrete negation of the negative is the other, the positive, open to us, solidarity in suffering and in struggling against evil. 
I like these uh, these two points, right? Uh, solidarizing every different men in group. <laughs> different men in groups is very funny, actually. <laughs> a very funny way of saying it. <laughs> I'm sorry. L- let me rephrase this whole thing. Solidarize- <laughs> solidarizing very different guys in groups and to leaving them open right, to right. Um, uh, the freedom shaping of their own future. Uh, very good notes on, on cooperation. But I appreciate, though, the falling back on the idea of a common future and a common good. An idea that is like ringing in my ears quite a bit as uh, I think more about climate change. I've still been finishing up Tad DeLay's book and I um, there's this part later on in his book. Sorry, this is another digression on digression. uh, But there's a part later (laughs) in his book where he's talking about how like every, you know, like every bit of uh, fossil fuel that you still burn has like some kind of promissory note in the future. And this kind of feels similar to that, right? There's a common future that we're all facing (laughs) And uh, it does make a lot of sense to figure out um, ways to create solidarity between people uh, to consider that that future that we are leaving open, the bad future even. Yeah, that's right. And I like uh, he goes on to say a little bit more um, after you're reading, too. He says solidarity in suffering and in struggling against evil, liberality in goods of the positive and the future belong inexorably together. And I like that part as well, that like. There's solidarity against these common threats, and there's also what he calls a liberality or kind of freedom in enjoying the the positivity uh, that could be around the corner. Um, he goes on to say, too, that none of the freedom movements mentioned above has already brought freedom in itself. He's talking about Christianity, liberalism, Marxism, some other stuff. But we find roads leading to its future in all of them. The realm of freedom is greater than all of them. It inspires all our endeavors, but it also condemns all our presumptions and comforts us where we become guilty. Uh, a great kind of like Hegelian move to be like, don't worry, all the contradictions are fine. Um, but I think it works. <laughs> and I like the, uh, again, that idea that um, it's the negative and the positive kind of belong together. They're they're reconciled in that uh, that concept of a sort of common freedom in the future. It is interesting like you just i mean like the the hegelian overtones are pretty noticeable throughout the whole thing um that maybe things will just be okay and uh i do find that a little bit (laughs) frustrating because like what if they're not um what if (laughs) things are just actually bad and nothing ever gets better and it doesn't matter if we struggle together or not uh that's a pretty big fear that'll keep me up at night i guess but um (laughs) i would rather just believe what milan's saying (laughs) maybe in the end (laughs) <laughs> yeah uh well there you have it moltmann uh, a towering figure who uh led a very long life and um he was an interesting guy i think as we said at the top of this uh episode he's interesting not only because he's doing some like kind of creative theological tricks or like giving you some cool rhetoric to play with but the kinds of things he was invested in were important enough to have been uh to have landed one of his books at in a, a literal crime scene assassination scene in San Salvador. And I think maybe that's kind of like the the note to close on is that what's really great about Mulmine is that he shows that you can um, you can do theology even working with like pretty, for lack of a better word, boring theological themes and kind of traditional themes and so on. You can do systematic theology and still find a way to like be meaningful in the struggle and to contribute something to the struggle so much so that, you know, when blood is shed, like it could be the, your ideas that are sort of in the room at the same time. And I think that is like a really cool challenge and important, like troubling challenge to, to Christians thinking and writing and being in the world is like, well, you know, I don't think it's like a feather in Moltmann's cap that his book was found at a murder scene. Um, it's not like a badge of honor. I think it's like a testament to the, you know, the necessity of the kinds of things he was thinking about. And I think that you can only really like judge that necessity based on where they show up in the lives of people who are oppressed. And uh, I don't know, for my part, Moltmann is uh, is worth reading as a European theologian uh, for that reason, that he's like trying to be accountable to those kind of struggles. Um, I don't know, Matt, what do you think? Uh, what, should we, what should we say about Moltmann as he's passed? Yeah, I think what you said is great. Um, I think that's all very cool, that this is a really positive contribution to the idea of liberation theology. It's a really positive contribution to people who do actual, you know, political work, that there are these, that our movements have something important to say, and they have something important to say to one another, and that there's a way forward together. I think that is extremely uplifting and very good. The thing that keeps like scratching at the back of my brain that maybe is a harder thing to reconcile to is the 
historicity of this particular chapter. This is, you know, we started the conversation saying this is written in 1969. It was a different time then. <laughs> you know, the the conversations between Marxists and Christians were um, more apt or had a little bit more power, I guess. And uh, you know, in, in light of in light of what's happened since 1969, um, in and even in Moltmann's own words, right, that there are disappointments, there are things that that don't work, that kind of like peter out. And it seems like in a lot of ways that conversation is one that petered out, that there's also a disappointment to find in that like type of 1969 conversation between Marxists and Christians. Um, not to say mm-hmm, it's over, mm-hmm. uh, but just to say that like it also didn't achieve freedom, but it does help us you right. know, keep thinking through what's, what's the next step. Thanks for listening to The Magnificast. If you like what you heard, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash The Magnificast. Uh, you can also, there's still time to register for this class on liberation theology. If you want to do it, you can go to uh, icscanada.edu and find all the information. It's six weeks. It is twice a week. And uh, it's great. It's really fun. We'll talk about Latin America a bunch. And who knows, maybe we'll even talk about Jürgen Moltmann if you want to. If you go to the <laughs> class and you talk about him, I guess I have to talk about him. It seems great. You, people should sign up. I've never taken the class myself, but I think that you should for sure. <laughs> We've had a uh, podcast folks in the classes before, and it is also really fun to get to know each other in that setting and get to know other people who want to be thinking about the same things. Um, it's rare to find that just out in the world. So it's great to have a, a dedicated space um, at ICS to do it. Our music is by Amaria Armstrong and the outro is by the Illogical Spoon. And we'll see you next week. Church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church. We'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation. Never get tired, never bored. Don't worry, someday there'll be no dam between us and our Lord. Jackson, you keep your hoods up. Keep your hoods up and you stay up late in Jackson. You keep your hoods up where you keep your hoods up.